Hey guys, Nate Madsen here. I'm going to do another walkthrough through a different skateboard track. For those that missed the last one, I did the Heron, and I published that maybe about a month ago. I'm not sure. It's been a little bit of time. I've slept since then. Um, but I haven't done another one of these, and I wanted to. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here going over Growing Up Red Tails. And I'll talk you through the track, show you some of the tricks that I did, some of the approaches I did, and we'll just dig in. So if you haven't checked out Skateboard, it's been out for a little while now. It's doing pretty well. Um, you can check out some of their views in Steam, and also it's on Xbox, it's on um, itch.io, it's on Luna, it's on Switch. So go check it out. It's had quite a few updates, and the team's been very busy behind the scenes working on making Skateboard even better. So check it out. Also, the soundtrack is available on Bandcamp, it's on Amazon, uh, iTunes, Pandora, Spotify, all the major platforms. So if you haven't checked it out, it's 27 songs. We were jokingly calling it Bird Bop, Lo-Fi. It's got hip-hop and soul and jazz and pop and EDM mixed in with these bird narration clips and also bird chirps. Some of these are actually sample birds from fans of the game, which I'll go into that more in just a second. And then it's just kind of this fusion of stuff that I put together, and uh, it's been well received, thankfully, and hope you like it. So this is Growing Up Red Tails. Um, you'll see real quick here, Swirl. Now I'm awful, terrible at naming my tracks. I often start a track, and I don't know if it's going to be a track that's going to end up in a game, or if it's going to be a track that's going to end up on the the editing editing floor. You know, it's on the cutting board. So I wasn't sure what this was track would be about. And so I usually just name things just to have a name for a little bit. And I named this one Swirl because some of the effects, come, some of the sounds kind of had a swirl effect to it. That's literally why I named it that. But then working with Megan, we would go through and we would name things either together or she would name it or sometimes I would name it after we got to know the identity of the track a bit more. So to keep things organized somewhat in my chaotic brain, I would rename them, but keep the original name that I had in parentheses. So a lot of the Skaper stuff is the actual title name that you see on the album or on the game, and then in parentheses, what I used to call it starting out, almost like a working title. Now, let's dig in real quick. And I hope you can't see this thing. Move that out of the way, just in case you can. All right, so I talked about the fact that we had bird chirps that were sampled from actual people. And this is one of them. Jenny Romachuk, she had this video. And by the way, I just, I use a software that just grabs the URL of whatever video it is. This was a Twitter video that she had. We had permission to do this. We asked her, she said, go for it. And so I download that video with this software and I pulled it into into Logic and then I removed the video but I had the audio which I then sampled. You can see here it's being controlled by this sampler. If I open up the mapping and if I play each of these, oh my keyboard's not on but I'll do it via mouse. Just the various sounds this, this bird is making. I have a couple effects on there. I've got a little bit of compressor and I got a delay going on. I can show you those real fast. Compressor is not doing much. The threshold's pretty low because this is a soft signal, and then delay is just two taps, and there's my wet to dry ratio right there. Nothing super fancy. I don't think I'm doing anything transposition or pan wise, it's all centered there. But <clears throat> to show you how this looks, in the heron, if you look back and you look at that track, I believe that was the track that I did. I was placing things out rhythmically on the grid, like cutting up little sampled um, chunks of the audio and then putting it in to the grid manually. It takes a lot of time. But doing it this way, where I have it sampled, and now my keyboard's on. You can see right here. You can see the dot moving around. Those are the things I'm playing. Doing it this way and being able to play it in via the keyboard was so much faster. Um, and then I could go in and make changes, I could change rhythms, I could really be working to the grid as opposed to taking the audio file and trying to move it around. So that was a huge benefit. 
So up here you just see some of the squat that I'm using here. And actually, you can see right here, this is where those samples were taken in. I brought in the samples, I spliced them up, and then I created a sampler track from those samples. So if I were to play this by itself, Right? <laughs> and so then playing it in rhythm. And what I'm trying to do with each of the samples I'm taking from these birds is find stuff that sounds interesting, stuff that either is somewhat melodic or percussive, rhythmic, and then will fit with the song. Speaking of the song, so I'm going to mute this. The next track over here, Birds of Prey, you're going to see, and this takes a while to, to appear in the song. This is some of the narration. During the nesting season, the parents are busy providing food. All right. You can hear some hiss in there from the recording. During I was okay with that being season, there. You can see me taking out some of the, the frequencies. During the nesting season, the parents are... If I bypass this... During the nesting season, the parents are busy providing food. There's a bit more noise. During the nesting season, the parents are busy providing food. A little less and then I'm compressing it as well. All right, so that's the narration. There's not much there. The first half of the song doesn't have any, and then it has a little bit more as the song goes on. Speaking of the song, let's take a look here. You'll probably be hearing my kids in the background. Oh, Sunday mornings. I think I start with this pad. So those that haven't met, played around with Arcade, really, really cool plugin from Output. And um, they have all kinds of really, really neat sounds in there. So it's a great primer. It's a great starter. It's just very evocative. So starting that out was pretty neat. Like, okay, this is making me feel something. Where can I go from here? So I started with that. Let's look at the marimba. Now this has a whole bunch of effects on it. Sorry, vibraphone, excuse me. Me just playing it in, it's not quantized. You can hear some of those effects. I'm going to take them off for right now. It sounds like a vibraphone. So if I put these two together. I don't mind it, but let's add each effect in slowly. Channel Q is not doing anything, but let's do the tape delay. Let's add in the movement. This is also output. The movement adds almost like a bubble type effect, it, a little warble to it. So let's take a look. I turned off the distortion with it on. It's nuanced, but with off. And the filter over here is off as well. So that was the starting point for the song. Um, I love, if you listen to any of my stuff, I'm heavy on the piano. Now this is using, this is a free frequency shifter. It's a great detuner. Um, I use this a lot. I go over to something that has a bit more piano. And without the effects, it's just going to be a regular piano. All 
By the way, you can see it's free. So I was looking for something that had movement to it that didn't have just the straight up sound of a, a piano or vibes. I wanted to have a little more warble, you know, like I said, lo-fi. This is all the lo-fi soundtrack. Um, let's look a little bit at guitar amp, or actually first, winter keys. I don't remember what this one is. Ah, yeah, okay, that one. This is a really cool effect. This is um, some of the beautiful stuff. Now I'll be honest with you, as a pianist I felt like, uh, am I cheating by playing this? I could play this in myself, but these loops all helped inform and pivot me into directions I normally would not go as a composer, as a producer. So I was like, I'm okay using this. I mean, I'm playing piano in other parts, so all right, I'm okay with that. You notice here I did not choose to use movement. Now let me check real fast and see... I don't think I have anything on there as far as that goes. Um, <clears throat> I don't believe I'm ever turning it back on. So I chose, I had movement on there, and I chose not to use it. Let's check it out and how it sounds with movement. I think I decide, eh, nah. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I didn't like that too much. So I left that off. Little guitar line. Okay, let's look at this line. So this is a loop that I pitched with Melodyne. Ah, uh, it's gonna do that crap. I'm gonna say, hey, go buy it. I mean, I bought it, excuse me, go buy the update. <laughs> It's a cool little thing. So let's see what key we're in here. I haven't looked at this in a while. Um, so we're, I guess we're in B flat. Ooh, don't need that big. Yep. So yeah, what I'm doing there is I'm doing starting in B flat minor. Then A flat, then E flat major. With the third on top. So, <clears throat> if you look right here, sorry, it took me a second to find my spot. This pad's in C minor, and so it is not in the right key. So, if I go back to Melodyne, I have things pitched down. It's not going much. C to B flat, a whole step. So, I'm not pitching it that much, but I did pitch it down some. And it has some movement on there as well. Let's listen to it without movement. And with. That rhythm. Again, so much of the soundtrack was me just trying to create moments that would have some groove. A lot of things, even just stack pads, maybe they're holding a long tone of a B-flat chord for quite some time, I'm going to make it have more movement there. I'm just going to kind of poke through. I haven't looked at this session in a very long time, so uh, it might be kind of scatterbrain in the flow of how I do things. Yeah, this vocoder is really cool. These are me just playing in rhythm. And that created a really neat movement. Let's, let's, let's listen to that right there in bar 25. Bass is looped. Oh. Let me show it to you.
and it continues, all right, that, that loop. And for those that don't know, this right here, this meant that I recorded here, but the same idea is being the, the MIDI from this track, 24, is driving 25. I don't do that all the time, but I did do that there. Sometimes I just record one and then drag it down. So, okay, cool. So we got a groove happening, the, the vibraphone from the beginning, it's made its third appearance here. And this is the first time this hard to remember ARP. This is also another arcade. I used arcade all the way through the soundtrack. I'm running that through, again, movement. That's a big time plugin for this whole soundtrack. And guitar rig was another one. Let's turn both of these off. A lot of the body is coming from the guitar rig. Okay. Double B. No, I'm not a guitarist. I, I dapple, but I don't, I'm not efficient to do stuff like that. And so uh, I, I love to use loops for guitars or hire people who do good guitars because I am not a guitarist. So let's listen to gone through that, gone through that. Um, we'll talk, well let's listen to the first little chunk of the song. We'll listen to about here, the first four chunks. Talk about arrangement in a second. So one of the first things about the opening is just the amount of space that's happening there. It's not super active. You have moments where you have that, again, the B minor, A flat to um, E flat major, and then just kind of holds for a second. And it holds. And then resumes, changes it up a little bit. And another hold. And then the groove happens. So there's a trade-off between sections. So the groove doesn't really kick in until 30, 32 seconds into the track. So we're starting off and it's just kind of blossoming, um, opening up like a flower. It's way overused as a cliche, but hey, it works. Um, and just letting things evolve. I'm drawing, I'm trying at least to draw the listener in. I'm not trying to bombard them and hit them with everything I have right from the start. Because good arranging is all about bringing in interesting things, taking out other things, and having things evolve. If your music is becoming too boring, perhaps it's not evolving enough. You're not bringing in new textures, you're not bringing in new melodic material, you're not bringing in new chord voicings. You can do a lot just with inversions. Uh, let me get my piano up here. I mean, I could play that same opening riff. The There's latency, sorry. That's the B flat minor, A flat to E flat. Then I can change the inversions of it. Changing the voicing of it. Do it again. change the rhythm of it a little bit, placement. There's three different ways to play it right there, and it's just the same three chords over and over and over again. So 
if you have a section, if you have a song that might be somewhat repetitive chord-wise, experiment with changing the inversions. The inversions, all it is is just changing the order of stacking of the notes. Instead of having your E flat, G, B flat, you might have G, B flat, E flat, or B flat, E flat, G, and then you're back to root, which is meaning E flat is on the bottom. E flat is the chord we're talking about. Mess around, there's all kinds of fun things you can do with that. All right, so now we've gone into the actual groove at 32 seconds. The bass is finally coming. The drums are really in for real. Now, we'll talk about what's going on here in just a second. But it's muting and unmuting. This is impact. Let me stop the music. It's probably hard to talk over this. These regions are muted nonstop, but this one's going back and forth. It's like a blinker on a car, right? So what's happening there is I had this cool little idea, and you can see it, the blue line going up and down. When it's um, when it's up, it's muted, and then when it's down, it's not. It's um, it's on, or maybe that's inverse. <laughs> uh, yeah, unmuted is up, muted is down. And so this, I loved this texture, I loved this idea. But let me take it without that. Ah, oh, crap. I'm gonna have to do it this way. Okay. If I have it just persist the whole time. It's cool, I like it, but it's just too present, it's too steady. Remember that idea about call and response, that space we had at the beginning? What I was trying to do here, if I get this back, was I wanted it to happen and then go away, and then come back and then go away. Now I could do that with volume automation, or I could just literally go in and turn it on and turn it off. It feels more like a call and response. It's playful. During the nesting season, the so try that. If you have something you feel like this is a really cool texture, maybe you're giving too much of it to your listener. Maybe you should play around with having it have its own rhythm and its own interplay between other parts of the song. Okay, so now we are a minute and 37 seconds in, or a minute and 36 seconds in, and finally narration is coming in. During the nesting season, the parents are busy providing food. Still right around that B-flat area. The brood usually consists of Hands three or four young. Okay, so we're going to talk about the trumpets here in just a second, but I wanted to show that the lead-in of the drums, and there's also the lead-in right here. Turn on automation. You see right here, this leads in. It's a nice little way, if you think about, okay, I have two small boys, and my oldest has special needs. So even though he's an eight, eight and a half year old, really, um, he's more mentally like a four year old. And he grabs my hand and takes me wherever he wants me to go. If we're gonna go play in his room with cars, he just grabs my hand and he just starts leading me, right? That's what you want to do in a lot of ways with your listener. And there are so many you know, arrangement and production and just um, uh, orchestration tricks you can do to guide, to grab the hand of your listener and, and guide them along. And they will follow you if you give them these little tricks. And one of them is these little fills. So this drum right here, I'll just play it. You hear how it increases in volume just right before you get to the downbeat. It's guiding, it's letting you know something's about to happen. And the same thing is happening over here. I've got a riser. Oh, I'm in the wrong section, sorry. Right here. Same thing's happening right here, a riser and a little drum fill.
it's prepping you. So if if you get feedback from someone who's listening to your music and they're like, ah, you know, that one section is just out of the blue, maybe you need to prep it a bit better. You can do some really cool out of the box things, um, maybe even like go to a completely contrasting, clashing harmony, but if it's not prepped right, it might feel like a slap across the face. The viewer is like, the listener is like, what's going on here? But if you prep it right, you can go to some really wild, crazy different spots. I'm not saying I'm doing that here in this track. I'm not. I'm just saying the prep gives you, the anticipation gives your listener a heads up. Something's about to change. Something's about to come. And then it lets, allows them to go on the journey with you instead of just being surprised by it. So look for ways that you can do that drum fills, risers, cymbal swells, melodic things that can happen, just ah, you know, something that's going to pull them in and say, we're going somewhere, this is developing. So that's why I did that. And this is a minute and 50 seconds into the track. Back up just a little bit here. Now, I did want to point out the vocoder that I had had before. Play it in context. It's all short, right? Do, 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 no, no. It almost sounds like they're saying no or do. But when you get to that big point, what does the vocoder do? Now, if I take off the movement plugin, got a little less movement to it but it's in this chord and if I play it in context with everything else that's happening you had the short do 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 and then you have just a chord so that's also a little payoff there is all of a sudden I have a long tone chord happening in the coder where before it was all percussive Let's take a break and talk about the trumpets. So I got John Robert Matz, he's a good friend of mine, amazing composer, amazing trumpet player, and he recorded this line for me. Just a stack. Now by itself, it's pretty vanilla, right? It's not super impressive. Um, but there's a lot of things that are changing around it, and so I felt like it was kind of a nice little filler. Bird changes, different guitar comes in, the coder's still doing his thing, and the vibes are back in, and narration's in, so there's more stuff happening, and then, the parent birds often bring rabbits or squirrels to the nest. Did you catch the riser? Dragging, or not dragging, <laughs> dragging, come along with me, listener, uh, guiding, pulling, the hand of your listener along the path saying we're evolving and then all the stuff that was grooving and building it's not a huge build but it is moving is gone and it goes out the parent birds often bring rabbits or squirrels to the nest but when food is scarce they may attack other birds Drums come back in. Haven't had pad yet. Don't think so. Comes in here. A case of hawk eat hawk. Okay, so John also recorded that trumpet solo for me too. And uh, I do want to point out one thing. For example, right here you'll see I've got the pad here, which is muted. These grayed out things are muted regions. They're not playing. Um, and I have a recording here of me, if I play this recording. It's just alto. Decide against that texture, and if I play this,
it just was too muddy and didn't work with it worked earlier it didn't work there so my point in bringing that out will point that out is it's really important to be able to edit yourself I tend I think to overwrite uh, a lot of my tracks I, I do if you see them in the earlier stages it's just idea 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 all stacked on top of each other and it's just too much right and so what I will start to do is move things around so okay I can't have all four of these ideas happening so let me start with the second idea and then maybe third idea and then first idea and then the fourth idea or maybe it's combos second idea first by itself and then second idea with one idea there and it starts to build an arrangement that way um, I have to spend a little bit of time spacing things out muting I try different combinations of things because I tend, I think, to make things too cluttered and be like, eh, this is too much happening. So don't forget to do that as a composer, as a producer. The parent birds often bring rabbits or squirrels. Okay, we're going to be do the trumpet solo is what we're going to do. Um, So John's a great, great player. And uh, I wanted to, if I take this stuff off, I, I'm doing a little bit of kaleidoscope. I can show you what it's doing. Got a little fl flange and phaser going on the trumpet there. And the guitar rig. It's gonna do some of the uh, beat mashing. That type of stuff, and that is used all the way throughout this entire soundtrack. If you listen for that, you're going to hear that doing to layers and to melodic um, components, sometimes even percussive components. It's going to be happening all over the place. But I, I didn't want it to be a regular trumpet solo. I wanted to have a bit more nuance to it and um, movement. And, and I keep saying the word movement. If you took a swig every time I use the word movement, you would be passed out. I think this part's really interesting too. Um, I originally recorded a, Trump, a saxophone line and I ended up hating how it worked. Here it is by itself. Let me just do it dry. Okay, let me do it in context. I wanted to have some saxophone in this track. Like, if you look at some of the other tunes, um, Atlas's, uh, Atlas's Gospel, excuse me, that's got my alto sax in there. I've got some other saxophone, but I wanted some saxophone in this because um, I did use sampled saxophone. I did use looped saxophone, but I'm a saxophonist. So I want to put my own stuff on there too. What I didn't like about this was it was felt like it was fighting too much with John's trumpet right here. It just wasn't working. So I changed it up a little bit. I use this thing called multi press, multi pass, excuse me. And that right there struck me as like, oh, cool, I like this being not a saxophone. If you can hear, it has the same idea. I'm trying to get it out of the way here. It has the same idea, but it is synthy. And I like the womp, womp. If you really listen to the sound, you hear some of that going on too. And I thought, well, that kind of matches with the swirl. So then I add some delay and reverb. I look at delay and reverb as two different ways of just smearing or smudging the sound. Uh, I used to take art lessons and painting with charcoal, and you have certain types of ways to smudge the pencil, the charcoal, to create certain effects. Um, or if you think about like you know painting, you can do certain things with water, and you can smear the oils a bit more to make certain type of reflective effects. That's what I was trying to do here. I love that da, 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 the, the, the gate basically that was was happening with the sound in the saxophone, but it was a little too harsh. So I wanted to soften it up a little bit. I wanted to smudge it. I thought that was cool. And then I add kaleidoscope. So that's how we went from this from 
from that to this. I'll do it in context. Here. You can hear the line, it's still there, it's still providing counterpoint to John's awesome trumpet solo, but it's not fighting as much without... Yeah, it's just fighting too much. But, not reverb for John's tr uh, delay for John's solo goes on. Here it is with the effects, and we'll, we'll finish it out here. These young red tails are nearly full grown, and they are learning to fly. That's Growing Up Red Tails. Thanks to John for that great stuff. He, he really helped me bring this track to life. Uh, one final bit, one of the things I love to do is to start a song and to end it in a similar way. Now it's not exactly the same. These young red tails are nearly full grown. And they are learning to fly. But reminds me, Dr. Blaze Ferrandino, I took a lot of classes with him in grad school. And his big thing, he was my theory professor, composition professor, and my advisor for a bit. And he talked a lot about, you can go on a trip, but when you come back, you, you're you still you, but you're different. You've been changed by the trip. And the idea, the hope in all of our songs that we're making for ourselves and for other people is that we're taking them somewhere. And so we start on our home base, this first idea. But when we come back to it after all this time, three and a half minutes, it's changed us. We've, we've developed, we've evolved from the progression of the song itself. So if you can do that, think about that in your songs. If you aren't going on a journey with your songs, maybe it's making your songs more boring, <laughs> to be blunt. Uh, I'm not saying my stuff is amazing, but um, the responses I've been getting, it seems like people like it, and they like grooving to it, and I've heard that the arrangements and, and the approach to it seems palatable. Um, I hope it is. That's why I'm trying, that's why I'm always trying to get better at. Each song I do, I'm trying to get better than the previous one. And then I do that song, and then I, I'm happy with it, and I do another one, I try to get better than the previous one. Better on my mixing, better on my, on my sound design, better on my orchestration, all that stuff. One last thing. I didn't show in the last video, I went to, <laughs> I went to just my, my screen on the, the Heron and I talked about how I did the production side. And I didn't go too deep into that in this track either. Uh, there's just a lot to talk about and I'm already at like almost 40 minutes here. But you can see here the individual tracks and what I'm doing. I'm singing some buses here and I, then I have, uh, or I'm singing some sins, I should say, and then I have a whole bunch of buses. And what I try and think about when I'm doing recording and when I'm doing producing is that each of these blue and green over here, blue is um, gonna be MIDI and, uh, sorry, green is gonna be MIDI, blue is gonna be audio, and then the yellowish color is gonna be on my buses. What I'm trying to do with all these things is each of these green and blue, they're like lanes on the highway, but they have to be summed down to whatever you are. In my case, since these are game tracks and these are uh, for albums too, they have to be some, all that information has to be summed down to two, to, to a stereo out. And I've got a lot here, a lot here to mess with. Um, 36. So 36 lanes of traffic need to be summed down to two. Well, then the way you manage that is just by going through and saying, okay, well, here are my sub-highways. So you have all these 36 lanes, you get subbed down to however many of these are. I don't know how many of these are. And then from there, 
those get summed down to your stereo. And it's like a highway system. We have, you know, if you have low end that's building up in even just 10 of your MIDI tracks or your audio tracks, and then those are being summed down to, you know, build up, build up, build up, build up, build up. Even if it's just a little bit, it's going to be compounded and it's going to really add up and make your mix money. So you go through and you make EQ changes on the tracks themselves and also on your buses. And then you make some more on your EQ on your final out. You start shaving things and just sculpting it down and manage that traffic load. Um, there, I'm from Dallas Fort Worth. There's the Mix Maxer there. It's this crazy just swarm of highways and uh, exits and on ramps and, and it's, 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 it's a mess really. But it sort of handles the flow of traffic. You want that to be this. You want to be able to just have all your ideas come down to a stereo track. And then I use, I try and bump up a little bit here but taper off my highs to control that. And then I love this Cakewalk LA-2A emulation. It's a T, uh, T type of amp, um, compressor. I, I just really love this. And then I usually do uh, an adapted limiter. And sometimes I mess with the gain, sometimes I don't. I always try and see the out ceiling, where am I looking, and I always want to have my true peak detection on from there. Uh, and then what this is not showing you, this is just the session I created the music in, and I put everything in, each track, 27 tracks, all the audio rendered out from each of those, I put them into a big session in Logic where I could just hear each track back and forth and I was listening to try and see am I getting everything roughly in the same ballpark. I don't want to have one track that's way up here volume wise and one track's way down here on my album. I want I don't mind some difference but I want there to be a nice little range instead of a really true gap from track to track to track to track. So I've rambled on for a long a long time here. I hope this was useful and somewhat interesting. Um, the first video walkthrough got a lot of positive response. I would love to see if this one does too. And what other tracks you would like to have me do a deep dive on for Scaper. If you haven't checked out Scaper, give it a shot. Go to Glassbound Games. Um, check out Scaper Rocks. Skate Burb, by, by the way, B-I-R-B Rocks. Um, we're on Steam. Like I said, Switch and Xbox and H.I.O. Luna. Uh, check those out. And if you haven't checked out the album, I'll put the link out as well. It's on Bandcamp and all the major platforms. Every little stream, every little purchase really helps support me and my family. And I so appreciate all the love that this game has gotten. And I will see you in the next video. Take care.